Minkowski toss, a quantum mechanical toy toss cannot be understood. It either, the spin is up or it's down, you know, and each time you have to do the measurement. So this is bad from an ultra-rational point of view, if you want to understand anything. Now, the way that Fredkin and Wolfram get around this, uh, Fredkin, they wave their hands and they say, our theory is completely deterministic, but we think someday we can get quantum mechanics out. So at the bottom scale, at very low scales, these people would argue the universe is deterministic, you know, maybe 30 orders of magnitude, I've heard Stephen Wolfram say, below our best measurements now, maybe the world is deterministic. And Wolfram would say that quantum mechanics emerges as at a much higher scale. So this, but he hasn't actually done it. This is a program. And Fredkin even less. You know, there, his viewpoint is very, very deterministic. Now my colleague Charles Bennett, you know, dismisses all of this and says he thinks to get quantum mechanics out, you have to put quantum mechanics in at the very beginning. And he works on quantum computation, and he may be right. So, so I would put this another way. To rescue these metaphysical speculations, you know, philosophers don't have to worry about this particular world. So it's just a possible world. So I would say that Stephen Wolfram's book, I would say maybe doesn't apply to this world, but it applies to toy worlds or possible worlds. Maybe this one isn't, is quantum mechanical, not deterministic. Wolfram gives a number of examples in his book where he argues that the world, what we think, the randomness we think is in the world may actually just be pseudo-randomness. It may actually be deterministic. He shows some examples, for example, uh, where you get turbulence from cellular automata models. And uh, it looks perfectly random, but it's only pseudo-random, like the digits of pi. Actually, there's a law, but the individual digits are random. And the way you can tell whether nature is random or not with turbulence is run the experiment again. If the turbulence, all the little eddies look exactly the same, it means even though it looked random, it actually was deterministic. So there are experiments which might be able to distinguish. But this viewpoint, I have to confess, does not work as well. If there's quantum mechanical uh, randomness, every spin up, spin down measurement adds one bit to the complexity of the universe, right? So, so this metaphysics works better, not only if the world is digital and there are no real numbers, if the world is discrete and there are no numbers, it also works better if the world is classical and not quantum mechanical. I have to confess that. So you asked a good question that's an embarrassment from the point of view of this, of this viewpoint, of this metaphysics. Okay. Yeah, Ron Chrisley, University of Sussex. Um, I had uh, two technical questions about your talk, but maybe there's only time for one, so I'll just try one. Um, I, I wanted, I, it seemed like your reasoning was something like um, on this conception of uh, the, what the real numbers are, um, uh, we are left with this rather absurd conclusion that we've just, the ones we've, the only ones we've encountered happen to occupy a set of measure zero or something like that and, and that seems to be counterintuitive and, um, and therefore you need to start again and have a different conception of of your set of reels or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure if I followed it accurately, but well, it I'm seems that one, there seems to be an assumption there that there's the, about the prior probabilities of the reels that uh, there's an equal chance that we would encounter um, any of the reels between zero and one. So if you instead have a... Lebesgue measure, if you like. For instance, or if, if, you had, if you had some... For instance, if complexity itself played a role in determining the prior probabilities of the numbers, then you wouldn't have this absurd conclusion, it seems. You wouldn't have this conclusion that the numbers we've encountered just happen to occupy this infinitely small set. So if you had that the chance of encountering a number, the prior probability of encountering a number is inversely you know, related to its complexity, then everything would cancel out and you'd have our intuitions restored, wouldn't you? Well, I don't know, if you want to play technical games, there are lots of different ways of, of uh, playing with this. The, the point I'm trying to make, not to get, uh, I'm sure you could develop an interesting variations and, and get the answer you want. <laughs> the, the point I'm trying to make is, I was trying to give physical arguments against infinite precision real numbers in the physical world. I was trying to summarize mathematical arguments saying that real numbers are problematical even from the point of view of the, of the world of pure mathematics of the world of ideas. And the reason I'm doing this is because this, uh, this epistemology, uh, you know, that goes back to Leibniz of, of, of saying uh, a theory goes in and you have a computer and you get out what you're explaining, uh, you know, computers only deal with discrete bits. They don't deal with real numbers. So this viewpoint is more universal if there are no real numbers in the physical world or in the world of mathematics. 
you see. So to make this, to, to suggest that this viewpoint may be more universal than you might think, I have to argue against real numbers, both from a physical point of view and even from a mathematical point of view. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, that's why I'm doing this. You see, to make this model look better than you might at first think, because this is clearly a discrete, a discrete metaphysics or uh, approach to epistemology, where I'm measuring information in and information out. So that's the reason I'm doing all this, which so probably wasn't clear in my confused presentation. Gordana is getting us to the next official question, but meanwhile, yes, sorry about that. I don't control who asks, gets to ask questions. Yes. yes. I'm coming back to your, uh, what you said about computability of real numbers. Yes. Uh, if, we inc if we allow programs to change its own code, what is the effect? There's no effect. Really? Yeah. Why? Because the set of all programs is still a countable infinity. It still can be put in no, one, but, one but, but with one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, but so in, that, that, no in that case, the program can grow. So we, we, we... Machine language programs can modify themselves and it doesn't change yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, this is a... Okay, you're saying... The question is creativity. If a program can modify itself, you, yeah. that looks like creativity and learning. Yeah. And the question is, does this make a difference? Yeah. Well, from the point of view of thinking of all possible programs as uh, this list of all possible programs, you see, so you, if you want to attack that assumption, you can do it. But you have to attack that assumption. And the way you can attack it, let me give you the best attack yeah. on my own thing yeah, the, 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 I've come up with, is you say that no computer programming language is universal, really, because computer programming languages change the same as human languages. So this notion of having a list of all possible texts in French or a list of all possible algorithms in your favorite programming language is really a mathematical fantasy, but it's bad because new concepts, languages change by adding new concepts and programming languages change. Yeah. And, and that this whole idea of a list of all possible programs or all possible texts in French is bad, you shoot it down that way. That's the way to shoot it down, I think. That's what you've got. You've got to go to the heart of the matter if you want to shoot it down. So you can argue that, th that that's illusory. Mm -hmm. And I accept that as a, as a legitimate uh, attack. Okay. Thank a... you. I think we, we can continue discussions with a co coffee break. So thank you very much, Professor. Thank you.